Hello and welcome to the 2024 season of Ollie's at the Lecture Series, at the U Lecture Series. I'm Laura Peterson. This at the U Series comes to you from the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota. Ollie is a learning community for people 50 plus who are curious, lifelong learners. We offer hundreds of non-credit courses a year, plus other ways to get involved, like special interest groups and volunteer opportunities. I want to extend a warm welcome to our OLLI members who are on this webinar, as well as our guests, and a thank you to our sponsors, AARP Minnesota and the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. We acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. Today's presentation is titled, Treating Cancer as an Invasive Species. Our guest speaker is Dr. Christopher Pinnell. Dr. Pinnell is the Associate Education Director of the Masonic Cancer Center at the University of Minnesota. His research explores tumor immunology, which is interactions between tumors and the immune system, and tumor immunotherapy, which is how the immune system can be exploited to treat malignant tumors. Dr. Pinnell, the floor is yours. So thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak to you all. Cancer is increasingly being viewed as an ecosystem, a community in which tumor cells cooperate with other cells and host cells in their microenvironment. And as conditions change, the ecosystem evolves and adapts to ensure the survival and the growth of cancer. So it's insidious. Um, if we employ the principles of ecology, cancer cells can be thought of to act as an invasive species uh, that employ, employs uh, different metabolic and reproductive strategies to hijack resources and space from the existing host cells, to evade um, defense and predation by the host immunity, and to cooperate to disperse throughout the circulation. And then this is followed by coevolution with the new microenvironments at the distant metastatic sites. So this is uh, the topic that I'm going to be covering. And I don't have any uh, financial disclosures. So what I wanted to do was to start with this video from the National Geographic Society. Rapidly growing, consuming, adapting, they conquer. Jeopardizing local economies, threatening human health, and devastating entire ecosystems. As whole rows of cherished landmarks are condemned, brought home to town-dwelling citizens are the rigid precautions being taken by the Department of Agriculture to save this tree from extinction. Invasive species are non-native organisms that cause considerable damage when introduced to a new area. These species compete with native wildlife for resources and thrive at the expense of the local ecosystem. The introduction of invasive species is often associated with human activity. Boats that travel between different bodies of water can carry hitchhikers, such as the zebra mussel. One of the most notorious invasive species in the United States, these rapidly reproducing mussels clog pipes and overtake beaches in the Great Lakes. Some invasive species, however, are introduced intentionally. In the early 20th century, cane toads were brought to Australia as a form of pest control. Today, these poisonous amphibians number in the millions and have caused a decline in native predators on the island. It's not just animals. Bacteria, fungi, and plants can also become invasive. Brought to South Africa in the 19th century, the black wattle is an invasive tree often used for timber and firewood. This beautiful tree and other thirsty invasives are depleting the country's already record low water supply. Because of their impact on human health, 
ecosystems, and infrastructure. Invasive species cost the global economy over a trillion dollars each year. Many measures can be taken to help limit the spread of invasive species, but the most effective method is prevention. By carefully cleaning boats before transferring between different bodies of water, not releasing exotic pets into the wild, and planting gardens with native species, we can help prevent the spread of invasive organisms. Every living thing has evolved to play a specialized role within their ecosystem. In the ultimate balancing act, even one invasive species can drastically tilt the scales. If we stay mindful of our role in the spread of these organisms, we can prevent invasions before it is too late. Okay, so I'm going to be using the invasive species ecosystem models to compare and contrast ecology with cancer as we go through this uh, talk for the next 45, 50 minutes or so. So there are a number of strategies to combat invasive species. Prevention, as they mentioned in the video, is probably the best tool that we have. And there are a number of ways that um, society has used to try to prevent the um, introduction of invasive species to new habitats. And these include education laws, inspecting boats, um, and so on. Next strategy is to detect these invasive species early with the hope of eradicating them before they become embedded in the environment. Um, tools that we use, eDNA is extracellular DNA. And so this is DNA that's released into the environment that can be detected with sensitive um, technologies. Different uh, DNA barcoding where we can identify what species the DNA came from. Traps that are specific for that particular organism that's invasive. Um, and again, education. Diagnosis. So this would be when the um, invasive species have gained a foothold and you're trying to understand their biology better with the goal of then trying to eventually eradicate them. Um, and then again, there are a number of different strategies that can be used for this diagnosis. And then treatment. How, you know, if you do have an, invas an invasion and it's getting kind of out of control, you know, what can you do? And so there are ways that... Um, um, animals can be introduced into the environment that are sterile, for example, or you can introduce a new predator into the into the environment, which of course has some downsides to it, um, and other mechanisms that you can use to combat invasive species. And then try to rehabilitate it. So bring back the community to its um, homeostatic or, or equilibrium that existed before the invasion of this species. So try to restore the natural flow of streams that may have been altered by different organisms, um, bolster native predators and so on. So there are many different strategies that have been used to combat invasive species. And in a moment you'll see that there are many parallels between these strategies and the ones that we use in cancer. So to just compare um, these different steps between what's used ecologically and what's used in cancer, if we start at the top, you've got the native population of fish, let's say. And in the terms of cancer, this would be the initial primary tumor, the tumor that arose from the outset. Then there's transport of this invasive species into the environment. And cancer can break away, as we'll show in a few moments, get into the bloodstream or the lymphatics and circulate throughout the body. And then it's introduced into a new um, ecosystem. And this is called extravasation. It's getting out of the vasculature, whereas intravasation was getting into the vasculature. So now it exits and it establishes and spreads. So there are many parallels between what's um, seen ecologically with invasive species and the way that cancer can develop. And so the goal would be, can we learn from each other? So this is a uh, one plug for the Masonic Cancer Center, which is where I've worked for the last 25-ish years. We are a National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center. We're only one of 56 such cancer centers in the country out of close to 1,800. So this is an elite designation. And the reason that we have this designation is that we have research and patient um, 
care and clinical options that span what's called the cancer continuum. And you can see that there are similarities between the cancer continuum and what we just discussed with respect to invasive species. So etiology means how does cancer spread? How does it, how does it start? So if you know how it starts and you can um, avoid it and prevent it, then you're better off than you're trying to fight something. So, you know, um, one, you know, I, I, um, one ounce is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Then we have screening. So if you um, are looking, if you think you have cancer and, and if you can screen for it and catch it early before it has a chance to establish your end business, then therapy, if you have a disease, how do you treat it? And then survivorship and palliative care. So you can see parallels already between the cancer continuum or ecosystem and what happens ecologically. So before we delve into cancer in more detail, uh, we have to take a biology 101 course. And this is um, this is as follows. So in biology, you know, we start off with small molecules, atoms that combine to um, form molecules such as DNA. And then different molecules come together to form a single cell. Then cells of the same type coalesce into different tissues. So muscle, for example, is made up of um, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of um, very similar cells, muscle cells. Then from a tissue, different tissues and different cells come together to form an organ like the stomach. So the stomach has cells that line the inside, there are acid resistant cells that line the outside. There are muscles that surround the stomach to allow it to function. Um, and so there are a variety of different cells and tissues that make up an organ. And then there are a variety of organs that make up a system like the digestive system. So not only does, is the stomach included in the digestive system, but the liver, pancreas, gallbladder, and so on. And then you put that all together and you, you get this cute little boy. So what we're focused on in cancer is the cellular level. This is the you know, mainly the level that we're looking at because when a cell goes wrong, cancer can result. And a cell is defined as the smallest basic unit of life that is responsible for all of life's processes and it can replicate by itself. So how do cells function? They function by following instructions that are encoded in DNA. And DNA is short for deoxyribonucleic acid. And this is a biochemical information storage and retrieval system. And so DNA is actually comprised of only four different molecules that are given the uh, designations A, C, G, and T. And each nucleated cell in our body, and the reason I made the distinction between nucleated cells and non-nucleated cells is red blood cells don't have a nucleus. Um, but every other cell in our body does. And each of these cells has about 12.9 billion of these letters that comprise DNA. And a cell's collection of all of its DNA is called its genome. So you've probably heard this word. That suffix O-M-E is used to describe an entire body of stuff. So there's a proteome, a transcriptome, a genome. Um, it's kind of like the gate and water gate where gate is used for everything now. Okay, and there are a number of analogies that you can use to think of a genome. And the ones that I like to think about are uh, using a hard drive or an old owner's manual or a cookbook, okay? So if we follow the cookbook or hard drive analogies, one file or one recipe is equal to one gene in terms of DNA. And this is a unit, a discrete unit of information that's used to produce a product. And in the case of uh, biology, the product of a gene is a protein. So the protein is what is the workhorse, okay? And hopefully all of this will um, make sense and come together you know, in the next few minutes, but I wanted to lay the groundwork. So how does a cell know what genes to use or what recipes to use? It all depends upon the signals that it receives. So this is a cartoon of a cell. The red circle is the membrane that keeps the outside out and the inside in. That satellite dish at the top represents a receptor that allows the cell to communicate with its external environment. This is the nucleus, which is the organelle inside the cell that houses the DNA. It protects it from damage. And then the ribosome is the factory that will make the proteins. So let's say you receive an external signal 
to make a protein. So that signal is delivered to the nucleus, and then the nucleus accesses the particular recipe that is being designated by that sequence. But that information stays in the nucleus. It doesn't get out because, again, if you corrupt that information, bad things can happen. So the way that the cell deals with this is that it transcribes that information into a molecule that then leaves the nucleus. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. <laughs> and that molecule is called messenger RNA. And then that goes to the ribosome where the the language of nucleic acids is translated into the language of proteins, which is amino acids. And amino acids are put together to make the appropriate protein that will respond to the external signal. So with that background, um, the odds are not in our favor. So the average human adult makes somewhere between 200 and 400 billion new cells every day. So if we take the average of that 300 billion cells, each of these cells has 12.9 billion nucleotides. And for one cell to become two cells, it has to copy the original DNA in that parent cell, such that each of the progeny has the identical copy that the parent had. So when you're copying this much, if you multiply 300 billion cells per day times 12.9 billion letters in the DNA alphabet per cell, you wind up with a number that's close to four times 10 to the 21st, which is 4 trillion billion letters of DNA are copied every day in our bodies. And to put this in another context, the length of that DNA is over 400 miles, which is about four and a half times the distance from the uh, earth to the sun. When you're copying astronomically large numbers of molecules, mistakes are gonna happen. And that's why we get cancer. And so the, can the, the mistakes that happen can be benign or problematic. And the mutations that lead to cancer are called driver mutations. And so what I have depicted here in this cartoon is a cell at the bottom left. And these brick walls represent barriers we have evolved over time to prevent cancer from happening. And the time scale is in decades. So typically cancer occurs later in life. So this cell is dividing, and as it's dividing and copying its DNA, its mutations are happening just because of the sheer numbers. Some of those mutations, like in the first case, the green one, allowed the cell to overcome that first barrier. And years later, it will um, acquire more mutations that allow it to overcome the subsequent barriers. And eventually, it will become a full-fledged malignant cell. And now you've got clinically apparent tumors. And so these barriers have evolved, but obviously if you get cancer, the malignant cells have arisen and they've somehow gotten around those barriers. So this is a movie on how growth, um, how cancer can grow and spread. Like every tissue in our body, solid tumors need a blood supply to survive and grow. As the tumour grows, it releases chemical messages into the environment that cause new blood vessels to sprout from nearby existing ones. These new blood vessels are drawn towards the tumour where they feed the cancer cells and allow them to grow. Each time the cancer cells divide, more mutations build up in their genomes. Because different parts of the tumour acquire different mutations, they behave differently. Sometimes one region of the tumour will grow faster and more aggressively than the others, causing the cancer to spread. All cells in the body, including cancer cells, must attach to the network of proteins that surrounds them. This is done by proteins called integrins. Integrins tell the cell about the type of environment they are in and give the cell instructions about what to do. In the case of cancer, particular integrins can send signals that tell the cancer cells to invade the surrounding tissue. So those integrins are like the satellite dish. Sometimes the invading tumour cells may reach a blood vessel, squeeze in, and enter the bloodstream. The cancer cells take a bumpy journey to a distant part of the body. Sometimes they are able to squeeze out of the blood vessel into healthy tissue, where they can start forming a secondary tumour. This ability of cancer cells to invade and spread around the body is called metastasis, 
and it represents the biggest challenge in treating cancer. Finding ways to stop cancer spreading is a major focus of research. Like okay, so that just gives you an idea as to how cancer can spread. And the word metastasis is a, is a double negative. Meta in Greek means beyond and stasis is stillness. So metastasis literally means beyond stillness or moving. And that's what um, leads to the majority of cancer cells um, fatalities. So again, thinking about invasive species, you can consider cancer to be weeds. They grow faster than the healthy cells. They can outcompete the healthy cells for food and oxygen, so they can starve them. As they grow, they can crush the healthy cells and destroy the normal function of those healthy cells. And so that's how cancers can um, lead to fatalities. This is a picture of a patient with a type of tumor called melanoma. The suffix OMA is used for a tumor. The first part of the word represents the type of cell that became malignant. So a melanoma is a malignant melanocyte, and a melanocyte is a cell that makes melanin, which is a, um, a pigment. So this is basically a freckle that became malignant. And melanoma at later stages can spread throughout the body, as you can see on that leg. It also has a, a tendency to spread to the brain. So these white arrows represent regions of a melanoma that are in this individual's brain. And so you can imagine as these cells grow and crush and kill the healthy cells around it, that um, this does not bode well for the patient. So another ecological way in which to think about cancers is to consider them as weeds in the body. So if we go back to our um, comparison of invasive species and cancer, we can see that there are a number of similarities. So the first one is invasion. When this cell up here, the one that's in a darker color, um, has acquired some mutations that will start to allow it to become malignant. And so that would be the counterpart in terms of ecology would be the invasion of an island by rodents on a ship, let's say. So now the cell has a growth advantage over the others, and it can start to proliferate, which is another word for grow. And these um, animals can do the same. And then it starts to spread by gaining access to different parts of the environment. And the two major highways in our bodies are the vascular system, the blood system, and the lymphatic system. So if a tumor cell gets into the blood, as you saw in the video, it can then spread to distant sites. So then how do you treat it? Um, there are a variety of mechanisms and they can either lead to success or failure. And so these again are just some um, comparisons between invasive species and cancer. So if we look at the, the distinction between the host and the invader, so for mammals, there's a big difference. So if you've got a new, let's say a rodent in an environment, well, that's gonna differ dramatically from the native species. In cancer, cancer is basically our cells that have gone rogue, if you will. So there aren't as many differences between a cancer cell and its normal counterpart than there is between a rat that just came onto an island and the native rodent species, right? Uh, there's greater diversity among similarly treated species. Um, so there are a number of comparisons that you can make. And the goal would be hopefully, as I said before, to, to learn from one another. So now let's take a look at our ecosystem. So the average adult, as I mentioned before, makes between two and 400 billion new cells every day. The average adult in total has about 100 trillion cells. Only 10 trillion, 10% of those cells are our cells, mammalian cells. The other 90 million or 90% are bacterial cells that grow on us normally. So we are walking ecosystems, 90% of which is not us. And most of these bacteria are commensal, which means that they have evolved to provide us with beneficial um, outcomes. And, and so it's, it's a mutually beneficial arrangement between many of these um, microbes and us. So that's what a commensal microbe is. 
And there are different bugs or bacteria in different parts of our body. So the oral cavity has different types of bacteria than the intestinal cavity or the skin, um, for example. So when you're thinking about an individual, you have to think not only about the cells that she makes herself, but the ecosystem that is carried on her body. So now let's expand this into the realm of um, tumor immunology. So let's say this is a cell that has acquired enough driver mutations to start to become malignant. It's too small though to become clinically apparent. So you are unaware that you have it, but as it continues to grow, it starts to become more pro problematic and it becomes more clinically apparent. But what's happening during this time is that it's modifying the local environment in which it grows. And that is called the micro environment or the tumor micro environment. And that micro environment contains not only tumor cells, but a variety of other normal cells that are in the vicinity of the growing tumor. So there are cells like fibroblasts, which are connective cells. There are cells of the, um, the vasculature. There are immune cells in there. And so there's this whole series of cells within this small environment uh, surrounding the tumor and in which the tumor grows. And insidiously, what the tumor does is it contacts and it changes the behavior of these normal cells to make the environment more conducive for the tumor cell growth. So there's crosstalk between normal cells and tumor cells, and the tumor cells essentially co-opt what the normal cell recipe booklet would be telling it to do, and it's causing it to access recipes that make, that enhance the environment of the tumor such that it can continue to grow. And then if it breaks off and gains access to the vasculature or the lymphatic systems, it could spread to distant sites. And so this, why the, this is why it's so critical to catch a tumor early, because if it's only located in one spot, it's more easily treated than it is if you've got to try to eradicate it in multiple spots. But now you've got tumors in different spots, and they're in a different microenvironment with different healthy cells around them and with different microbes around them. So each of these environments is slightly different from one another, even though they have the same tumors in there. And this is why trying to treat metastatic cancer can be so complex because each environment is slightly different. Tumor cells may have changed slightly from one area to another. And so you're trying to treat a variety of different diseases rather than just one. And with that, I'd like to segue into types of cancer therapy and how our um, microbiota can affect different therapeutic strategies that we use. So cancer therapy has evolved over the millennia. Um, but prior to the 1800s, the only tool we had in our tool belt was surgery. And we know from historical records that surgery was employed three, 4,000 years ago in certain civilizations to um, treat cancer. So there was a movie that came out in 2006 called 300. And my son was a young guy at the time and he loved the movie along with his buddies because it was about guys fighting. And 300 referred to 300 Spartans that were able to repel an invasion from Persia for three or four days, which gave the other city-states in Greece enough time to mount a, um, a response to the, to the um, invasion. And they were able to repel them because they stationed themselves at this bottleneck um, called Thermopylae. Part of the reason for that war was breast cancer. So the queen of Persia at the time had, and we know this from records that have persisted, she had a type of breast cancer that was very painful. And it was so painful, she wanted to have a mastectomy to relieve herself of the pain. She had a slave who was Greek and he was a physician and she asked him to perform the mastectomy and it was, it was successful, which was amazing. And after she recovered, she was so grateful she wanted to repay him by freeing him and giving him land in his native Greece. So she mentioned this to her husband, who was the king of Persia, Darius. And he said, yeah, that's a great idea, but we don't own Greece. And she said, well, go get Greece. So that was one of the reasons why Persia invaded Greece. So we know that cancer surgery was used you know, back um, to 3,000 years um, BC. At the turn of the last century, 
radiation and chemotherapy um, were new armaments that we could add to treat cancer. And then at the beginning of this last century, we've become um, more precise in our abilities to treat cancer with two types of approaches called precision therapy and immunotherapy. And what's driven this evolution in cancer therapy is specificity. If you can kill only the malignant cells and not any healthy cells, including those from which the tumor was derived, you can give much more of the drug and hopefully therapeutic um, doses that will eradicate the tumor and minimize side effects. So let's just take a little bit, let's take a, a deeper look in these different levels of therapy. So surgery is pretty obvious. So we're going to skip to conventional therapy, which is chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And these work by killing rapidly dividing cells. And the reason that rapidly dividing cells are susceptible to chemo and radiation therapy is that more of its DNA is exposed at any one time than would be exposed in a cell that is not dividing. So I told you that each day in our body, we make 410 million miles of DNA, roughly. Well, the amount of DNA in a given cell is about seven feet long, and that's pack packaged into the nucleus, which is about one five thousandth of an inch in diameter. So this is a heck of a packaging job. For this DNA to be copied such that each daughter cell has an identical um, compartment of, of DNA or component of DNA, this DNA has to be unraveled from its packaging and exposed to the enzymes that will copy it. And rapidly dividing cells have more of their DNA exposed at any one time than cells that are not rapidly dividing. And so if a rapidly dividing cell is exposed to DNA uh, radiation or chemotherapy that can damage the DNA, the exposed DNA is going to be damaged much more um, frequently than the DNA that's packaged up and hidden away by these proteins. And so rapidly dividing cells, which cancer cells are, are susceptible to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. But unfortunately, we have many healthy cells that are also rapidly dividing, such as those in our bone marrow, in our digestive systems, our hair follicles. And so it's the loss of these healthy cells that causes the toxicity that you see in cancer patients. So the next step towards specificity was to try to identify things that were unique about a tumor with respect to the healthy cells from which it was derived. So if you could then identify a tumor-specific target, um, you could then hopefully preferentially kill tumor cells without killing healthy cells. And an example of that is um, in about a third of metastatic colorectal cancers. About a third of these malignancies overexpress a receptor, which is what this R stands for, for a growth factor called epidermal growth factor receptor. And these satellite dishes number thousands of times more than they would on a healthy colorectal cell. And the net result of that is that the cell is getting bombarded with signals to grow. And this, so this is part of the reason why these cells grow so rapidly is because they're hypersensitive to very low levels of this growth factor. So when this was identified, researchers made molecules that would block the ability of this receptor to recognize the growth factor. And this had two effects. One, it turned off all of these growth signals, so the cells became quiescent. And the other thing was that this um, covering of these molecules served as red flags for the immune system to come in and destroy these tumor cells. And so this antibody can be used only on tumors that overexpress this growth factor receptor. And that is a subset of colorectal cancers and also a subset of breast cancers, but it can't be used on other tumors because they don't express this tumor specific marker. Now the field is moving towards what's called patient-specific or precision medicine. And this is where we are trying to tailor treatments to your particular disease, considering your particular genetics. And there are two types of precision medicine approaches for cancer therapy. One is called pharmacogenomics. As the name implies, it's a combination of pharmacology and genetics. And so we can sequence your, your, the DNA in your tumor cells, identify which genes are mutated, sequence DNA from your healthy cells to identify what enzymes you make, and then tailor the drug to your own biochemistry. And so I've just got a, a cartoon just depicting this. 
So these are four individuals that are genetically distinct based on, or as depicted by the different colors, but they all have the same type of malignancy. And let's say it's a type of leukemia. And let's say we have four different drugs that we can use to treat this leukemia, but physicians know from past experience that some patients can tolerate one drug and another drug may be toxic to them. So how do you know which one to give them? Well, if you sequence, you sequence the DNA, so you know you've got these four drugs to choose from. And then if you sequence the person's own DNA, you can then hopefully match the appropriate drug with the appropriate person. And then if this individual has a different malignancy, you can give them a different drug. And so this is where the field is going. It's at its infancy. We're just starting to be able to do this. The second approach is using the immune system. And as the name implies, immunotherapy uses the immune system to treat a disease such as cancer. And immunotherapy has been a game changer for cancer therapy because it has four characteristics. One is that it's exquisitely specific. This is why the immune system can recognize a virally infected cell and kill it and not kill a healthy cell that is not infected because it recognizes the virus protein is not being us, not being self. It's incredibly potent. One killer cell, one immune killer cell can kill thousands of tumor cells or virally infected cells. It has a memory, which is why vaccines work. And it's adaptable. So one characteristic of tumors is that they are genetically unstable. They will um, develop slight mutations as they proliferate. Well, the immune system can um, play catch, catch up, if you will, with them. So one of the functions of the, or the primary function of the immune system is something that we call um, um, homeostasis. So the, the immune system functions to maintain balance or equilibrium or homeostasis in the body. And when that homeostasis is perturbed by injury, infection, or disease, the immune system becomes activated. And under normal physiological conditions in a healthy individual, the immune system will eradicate that source of perturbation. It will heal the wound, um, cure the disease, um, eradicate the infection, and you'll go back to your homeostatic or equilibrium baseline. One key function of the, of the homeostatic um, properties of the immune system is immunosurveillance. And this means that the immune system is constantly removing newly formed nascent tumors. And this happens throughout our lifetime. We know this from animal studies, and we know it from anecdotal studies of immunocompromised humans. So you can think of these barriers that I showed you before, these brick walls, as um, being immune surveillance is spread among them. So that's one of the mechanisms by which we can um, avoid getting cancer. And again, if you think of the numbers, the sheer numbers, 300 billion new cells a day, mistakes are going to happen when numbers that are, are that large. And if a mistake encodes a new protein that the immune system can recognize as being foreign, it will eliminate that cell before it has a chance to become a clinically apparent tumor. So by definition then, a tumor that is clinically apparent has escaped immune recognition. And one way to think about this is that tumor cells have erected a barrier between themselves and the immune system such that the immune system cannot access or kill the tumor cells and they can continue to grow. An immunologist literally a hundred years ago recognized those four characteristics that I mentioned, potency, specificity, longevity, and adaptability as being key to curing cancer. But we couldn't take advantage of the immune system's characteristics up until about 15 or 20 years ago because we didn't understand how this immune suppressive barrier was constructed. But through basic research, we have a much better understanding now as to what the bricks and mortar are in this wall. And with that knowledge, we can come up with a number of strategies to circumvent this, um, this immune block, uh, this, this um, barrier that tumors have um, erected. And one strategy is called immune checkpoint blockade. And figuratively, this is basically lowering the height of the wall or compromising the integrity of the wall such that the immune cells now can access the tumors and kill them. 
And this is the type of therapy that's kept Jimmy Carter alive for the last 15 years. And it's been a game changer for, um, for immunotherapy. So Jimmy Carter had um, malignant melanoma, skin cancer, that was diagnosed about 15 years ago. He was refractory to a variety of standard therapies. He was put on immune checkpoint blockade, and um, he's still alive today. All right. So let's go back to the ecosystem model. And the reason is that it was found that not everybody responds to checkpoint blockade like Jimmy Carter did. And so individuals, which we were trying, the field was trying to understand why some responded well and some didn't. And it boils down to what bacteria you have in your body. So this is a graph from a relatively recent paper. And it was looking at non-resectable liver cancer. So the liver cancer um, could not be um, removed surgically. It was impervious to chemotherapy. And so these patients were put on this type of immunotherapy. And the blue line represents those individuals um, that had a particular type of bacterium called Prevotella 9 at, high, at a relatively high number in their gut. The red line represents individuals that had a rel relatively low number of this type of bacteria. The individuals with a low number of this type of bacteria survived longer than the individuals with high amounts. So the average MMOS means median um, observable um, overall survival. So in this case, it was 17 months, so more than double what it was for individuals with this type of bacteria. There was another type of bacteria that was beneficial. So these individuals had more of this type of bacteria, uh, lacnoclostridium, than these individuals in red. And so they responded better to the chemotherapy than these individuals did. And it's not just isolated to those two types of bacteria. If you look at what's called the microbial signature, so it was a whole variety of different microbes, individuals that had this particular microbial signature did much better. The, the median um, overall survival was almost 23 months compared to eight months or five months. And so this was this was profound. You know, we we didn't expect this. Um, and so now the question is, you know, well, how, how does this work? Bacteria make a number of molecules met called metabolites. They get into our our lymphatic system, our blood system. They can be systemically distributed throughout the body. And obviously, they're going to be higher in the areas in which these bacteria grow. So in the gut, in the colon, there are immune cells that have satellite dishes or receptors for molecules that can be made by some of these bacteria. And these molecules deliver an inhibitory signal to the immune system that will downregulate an anti-cancer response. So if you have a lot of bacteria that are making this molecule, it's likely that your response, your response to anti-immune checkpoint blockade is not going to be that good. If you have less of this, it's going to be better. So the bacterial products are what can modulate immune responses and can swing a strategy from um, effective to non-effective. And by looking at tumors in a variety of different areas that are populated with different bacteria, the field is starting to understand who will what bacteria um, predict a better response than others. So in red, in these different locations around the body, these, are, these bacteria are enriched in patients that respond well to immunotherapy. The blue represents um, bacteria that are enriched in patients that don't respond well to that type of therapy. So with this information now, we, we know how to get around the, the barrier that tumors have erected. And now we're starting to realize that the microbiota or our ecosystem actually can affect the immune response. So the question obviously would be, well, how, you know, how can we manipulate this for therapy? And there are a few different mechanisms that you can imagine. So if there's an overabundance of a particularly bad bacteria and you've got a, a particular antibiotic that will selectively get rid of that, well, maybe you can get rid of it before you give the therapy. Conversely, if you know that this individual is depleted of a, of a good bacterium, 
you could give them some probiotics that will hopefully strengthen or increase the numbers of that. One of the ways that this was done initially is through a process called FMT, which is um, a very nice acronym for a um, pretty disgusting therapy, which is called fecal material transfer. So basically you take the fecal matter from an individual that is a good responder and you put it into the intestines of an individual that is a poor responder with the hope that the engrafted good bacteria will overtake the bad bacteria, if you will, and work. And um, we had, a, I have a colleague here at the U who's a pioneer in this field. And when he, he was, we have faculty talks where we talk about our research to try to get good ideas. And he was showing us blenders in which they would homogenize the poop. And we were like, Alex, we really don't want to see this, you know. Um, and initially what they did was they would gavage, which means they would put the, the good poop down somebody's esophagus. Now it goes the other direction through colonoscopies. But the goal is to try to identify what the good bacteria are and put them in a pill so people can take it that way. So. This cartoon kind of summarizes the way in which we're thinking about cancer therapy now, keeping again the ecosystem and the invasive species models in, in mind. So the gut microbiota can affect the immune system, and there's interplay between the immune system and what's in the gut. The immune system can um, regulate cancer unless cancer erects a barrier, and then we have to modify the immune system. The gut can also affect how cancer grows. These checkpoint inhibitors are um, those immune-based immunotherapy strategies that will hopefully kill cancer, but it's dependent upon your, your local ecosystem, what is in your gut or your skin and what your immune system is like. And so just to summarize, uh, I think this is my penultimate slide. If we just go back and think about the cancer ecosystem, it's comprised of a variety of different um, subsystems, if you will. So there's the primary tumor, the initial cell that became malignant, the microenvironment in which it's growing. So it modifies the healthy cells such that the healthy cells will contribute to the growth of the tumor. It then can metastasize and move to different sites. This process is called, uh, there's a hypothesis that was put forth a number of years ago for the metastatic potential of cells, and it was called the seed and soil hypothesis. And what this means is that as a tumor cell breaks away and gets into the bloodstream, it can go into basically any place in the, hum in the body. But if the soil or if the microenvironment is not conducive for the growth of that single tumor cell, it will die. So it needs to find um, a microenvironment that is conducive for its growth. And that's partially dependent upon the microflora that are there. So all of these things have to be taken into account when we're trying to develop new therapeutic strategies for malignancies that are refractory to surgery or standard chemo radiation therapy. Um, and this is what we're working on here in the Cancer Center. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to stop my presentation and stop sharing. And um, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. I'm sure I'm not going to be able to answer them all. And just as, as, a, as a caveat, I'm a mouse doctor. They don't typically let me near people. So if you ask me that I'm on this type of drug and, and what's the dose I should use, I will not have a clue. Okay. So I, I know the basics, you know, the basic immunology and biology, but not the clinical. All right. Well, with that caveat, we do have a couple of very interesting questions for you. Uh, how much awareness and or research is occurring at the Masonic Cancer Center with respect to cancer and metabolic disease research done by Professor Thomas Seyfried at the Boston College? If you know, he developed and published the Press Pulse Protocol to treat cancer. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. Um, so I can't oh, sure. speak to it. Um, sorry. Um, no, that's okay. Um, but but that's okay. we have uh, the cancer metabolome is an active area of interest for many of us here at the university. And the reason is that tumor cells use a different sort of fuel 
than healthy cells do. And healthy cell has to switch its input from, let's say, um, you know, regular gasoline to E85, for example, to grow better. And so we are, uh, there are a number of studies that are ongoing to try to figure out what dictates this switch? How can we interrupt the switch? How can we give it a different food source that will not allow it to grow as well as that? But I don't know if that that particular study. I'm sorry. That's okay. That uh, brings up another question I have. What is this different food source that tumor cells use that healthy cells won't? Or don't yeah, use so healthy much? cells typically use glucose, and right. malignant cells use glutamine. And glutamine is used. Um, because it can provide a number, it, it can provide the building blocks for a number of molecules that the cell needs to grow. So when one cell becomes two cells, it not only has to copy its DNA, it has to copy all of the proteins, all of the fats, everything that the cell has. So each of the two daughter cells has the same component, you know, components. And so um, glutamine, glucose can be shuttled to do something else, and glutamine can be used to make some of these other components. That the cell needs. I have never heard that before. That is fascinating. Thank you. Um, all right, here's another interesting question. Can you comment on what treatment is expected to be able to be done when CT DNA tests reveal cellular level cancer long before a tumor forms? Yeah, so CT is circulating tumor DNA, and that's analogous to that eDNA I, I showed in the invasive species. It's essentially DNA that's been released by a dying cell. And so what we can do is use very sensitive DNA sequencing techniques to look for genes that we know are mutated and associated with particular types of cancers. So if you take a, um, a blood sample from me, for example, um, and you think I might have, um, maybe I have a family history of pancreatic cancer, for example. We know that a particular driver gene for pancreatic cancer is called KRAS. We know what those mutations typically are. So somebody might sequence you know, this free-flowing DNA in my blood to see if there are copies of this mutated DNA. And if there are, then they're going to look much more closely in you know, my pancreas with maybe very sensitive imaging techniques to see if there's um, the existence of a particular tumor. So it's a type of screening technique. But the thing is, you have to know what you're looking for. You just can't go fishing for something. And so that's why, you know, if somebody has a, a family history of a particular malignancy, they might want to be screened using this very sensitive technique um, that would hopefully detect a tumor when it's only 20 cells big as opposed to 5 billion. All right. Um, do the bad gut microbiotas metabolites improve their own survival chances? And if so, how? Yeah, you'd think that they would because they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be um, at a high prevalence if it didn't confer some growth advantage to them. Um, I don't know the mechanisms by which those metabolites allow that particular species of bacteria to predominate. You can imagine maybe it, it suppresses other bacteria. Maybe it causes some host cells to create a more conducive microenvironment for that particular bacteria. So, you know, there are a number of dis different scenarios that you can imagine. And I'm sure microbiologists that work in this field know, well, I know they know more than me about it, um, but I don't know the specifics as to what it is. But if something is in, in higher numbers relative to something else, it's because it has had some sort of growth advantage. And that's evolution in a microcosm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, someone else is commenting that they've heard that immunotherapy can bring substantial side effects in some people. And do you know why this occurs and what those side effects are? Yeah, so this is, so I'm gonna digress for just a second, but it's going to actually answer the question. So this whole immuno checkpoint blockade field arose from an immunologist doing basic research. And about 20 years ago, a fellow named Jim Allison was interested in how an immune response is turned off. Most everybody at the time was looking at how you turn on an immune response to make better vaccines, to make better therapies. But we know that if an immune response is not turned off, you can have detrimental effects due to autoimmunity 
and inflammation and a variety of things. So Jim Allison was interested in what turns it off. And he identified a couple of molecules that were key for turning off an immune response. And then he made this leap of logic in which he thought, I wonder if cancer cells know this off switch. And so then he looked in tumor cells and found out that they did express this immunosuppressive molecule. And that was one of the bricks in that wall that I showed you, where tumor cells basically co-opted the normal immune turnoff mechanism for their own benefit. And then he was able to make antibodies that prevented this from happening. And he won the Nobel Prize in 2018 for that. So one of the downsides to immunotherapy is that you may be compromising your own healthy immune system. So you may be more, you may be more um, susceptible to infections, for example, or perhaps an autoimmune response might occur. And in other types of immunotherapy that I didn't describe that I'm actually studying in my lab, we can genetically engineer white blood cells to recognize tumors as being foreign, mm -hmm. like they're virally infected, and they can kill those cells. But unfortunately, they also kill, because of the target we present them with, they'll kill a number of healthy white blood cells. So your immune system is compromised. So there are downsides to every therapy. There are side effects. But these therapies are given to individuals who are terminally ill and have failed every other type of therapy. So the, the option is death or side effects. Which sort of brings me to another question. Uh, do you think that, um, first of all, I had no idea what was keeping Jimmy Carter alive so long. So that was very interesting to hear about that. Do you think that that treatment that he had access to is something that is available to everybody? Yes, it is. Yep. Oh, okay. It, it isn't cheap, <laughs> but it's available. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an FDA approved therapy that's available to everyone. And it's being used. It's being used worldwide, very widely, and that's based on the work that Jim Allison and another investigator, um, um, Hanjo in Japan, came up with. They identified some of these molecules that T cells have co-opted to turn off the immune system, and then they developed ways to prevent that from happening. And these are commercially available and FDA approved, and they're used wide. They're used widely now. Is that the um, immune? blockade? Yes, immune yeah. checkpoint blockade. And you'll see um, examples. Uh, the, the trade names for these are Yervoy. Um, I don't know how they come up with these names. Um, Ipilumumab, Premalizolumab, names that, you know, basically make me twist my tongue all over the place. Um, but yeah, there are, there are a number of these that are out there now. And in fact, <laughs> on TV, you know, you <laughs> My wife and I were watching TV the other night, and there was an ad for an immunotherapy reagent that would help with eczema. And that's an, an immunotherapy that blocks a molecule that causes inflammation. Um, but that molecule also does some other good things, so you've got to be careful. So there's always, unfortunately, uh, yin and yang to any sort of therapeutic approach. Water by just... itself, water can be toxic. If you drink too much water, you can die, and we know that. I mean, you know, gallons and gallons. So it's all a dosage effect, right? So there's everything good has a bad side. <laughs> Do you have an opinion on um, how much more successful immunotherapy might be than chemotherapy and radiation? Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, not a convert. I've been a believer since graduate school in immunotherapy. So this is the way that the field is going. Um, yes, I think it's going to be... Um, it's going to, it's it's already exploding. It's a, it's multi-billion dollar industry. Um, so companies, big pharma is behind it and they wouldn't get behind it unless there was money to be made. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're, we're learning more and more about how to make our therapies much more specific and how to reduce side effects. So here's a plug for my research. Um, one of the type of immune therapies that we are using is called chimeric antigen receptor therapy or CAR T cells. And these are genetically engineered killer white blood cells. One of the side effects of this therapy is um, neuroinflammation. So inflammation in the brain. This was totally unanticipated until it was put into people. 
and we still don't understand how it works. So my colleagues and I here at the U have developed a mouse model that captures all of the good, all of the anti-tumor effects of this type of CAR therapy, and the mice experience all of the known toxicities that people experience, including um, neuropathies. And so what we're trying to do now is understand how this happens with the goal of tweaking the immune, tweaking the genetically engineered cells such that they don't do it. And so that's that's where the field is going in these sorts of steps. But the specificity component of the immune system is unparalleled in biology. And that, again, is the holy grail of cancer therapy, which is why I believe immunotherapy is, is the way to go. So really, just to recap the benefits of immunotherapy, are you saying that adenocarcinoma in, in Bob is not the same adenocarcinoma that's growing in Mark or Betty, that they're all that they're all different, or it's the same, but but Mark and Betty's body handle it differently. Yes, and yes. <laughs> it's the same, but it's different. So the reason why we can use the same type of therapy for a particular disease, let's say adenocarcinoma in Bob and Betty. Um, is because those adenocarcinomas in those two individuals share a common biology and they share some commonalities. But there are definite genetic differences between Bob and Betty, and there are differences in their microbiota. And then even within Bob, let's say, his cancer started from one cell that became two and four and eventually became a billion. And during that expansion process, subtle mutations occurred, as you saw in that second video. And so even though a tumor is derived, all of those billions of cells came from one original cell, there are subtle differences within that population because of mutations that occurred during this massive expansion. And that's why um, cancer recurrence typically happens. So you treat a patient with a chemotherapeutic agent and it will kill 99.99% of the tumor cells, but there's a 0.001% that have mutated a gene that makes it resistant to that chemotherapeutic drug. So the vast majority of the tumor is killed. The patient thinks that they are cancer-free, but that one or two cells that survived then we'll start to grow and grow and grow. And then in a, a year or two, there are enough cells be, where it becomes problematic and clinically apparent. And now that second recurrence is resistant by definition to the original therapy. And so now you've got to treat it with something else. And so one area of active interest is combining different therapies, you know, giving two or three or four at the same time to try to kill all of those subclones, those mutant variants that have arisen. But again, when you're dealing with three or four drugs, each has its own side effects. And so it's, you know, it, it's a bit of a balancing act. Uh, why isn't immunotherapy used as a first line treatment rather than the, putting a patient through chemo and radiation? Initially, it was because it was, um, um, we didn't know as much about it as we did with the other therapies. I'm sure there were litigious, you know, legal reasons that if you were put on a, a relatively new drug and you didn't do well, you know, you might you might get sued. But immunotherapy now for some malignant uh, for some diseases is the first line treatment. Um, so as I mentioned, psoriasis, it's not a it's not a, um, cancer, but some of these drugs can be used as a first line treatment. Some of these immunotherapies can be used as a first line treatment for them. For cancer therapy, what we're looking at is trying to combine different types of immunotherapy with chemotherapy. Again, it's this combination approach. But when you combine more than one therapies together, it's it's very difficult and um, because of the side effects and stuff. But anyway, to answer your question, some types of immunotherapy are becoming first line approaches. But again, you've got to balance the you know the side effects with the benefits. And here's a $64,000 question. How can we reduce the cost of immunotherapy to make it available more universally? Single payer system. <laughs> yes, I am with you on that. Yes. I, I, I you know, I don't know. Um, so this car therapy that I mentioned before, uh, the average cost is on in the neighborhood of like $400,000. 
And um, it's called a living drug because it's your own cells that we take out of you, genetically manipulate them, put them back into you. And those cells we know can persist for, for years. So you only have to get one dose of it, but it's an expensive process. What's going to happen is, you know, as the procedures get more streamlined and there's more competition, the price will come down. But I don't, you know, that's above my pay grade. On, yeah. So anyway. Um, so if you get immunotherapy and it's successful and you're in remission, uh, does that last forever? Does do immunotherapy stay in your body? Do you need repeated treatments? And if so, would the cancer be susceptible to them? Do we know? Yeah, that's a good questions? question. So it depends upon the immunotherapy. So for this type of CAR T cell therapy, which is a cell-based therapy, we know that there are some patients that um, the disease comes back. And when we look for these CAR T cells, we can't find them or they've, be, they've been shut off by ways that we're trying to figure out. And some patients that are still cancer-free 10, 12 years out from their treatment, we can find those, those genetically engineered cells that are still in their body and they're still active. So again, it depends upon the person. And we don't know what those differences are due to. Kind of like with the checkpoint blockade therapy, there were responders and non-responders and people are starting to figure out now it's due to the microbiota. Maybe that has something to do, excuse me, with um, this type of cell-based CAR T-cell therapy. What we do know though, is it's, this gets back to your original question, Laura, about um, the fuel that feeds these cells. We know that the CAR T-cells that become exhausted or non-functional are not using the fuel in the way that the healthy functional CAR T cells are. So they've changed their metabolic processes in ways that we don't fully understand, which is another area of active research. This is so incredibly complicated. Oh, it is. Um, and it's fascinating. I mean, it's just, um, it's a horrible disease. I've lost loved ones to it. Um, but if you can um, separate that human cost, the disease itself is just fascinating. And um, I wish we had a cure for cancer. There will not be a single cure for cancer because cancer is an umbrella term that's used to describe literally hundreds of different diseases. And as you mentioned a few minutes ago, Bob's adenocarcinoma is different than Betty's adenocarcinoma. And so all of these subtle differences make it um, an impossibility that there will be one cure for cancer. We've done really well with many malignancies like childhood leukemia. In 1960, 90% of children with that diagnosis would not survive. Now, 10% will not survive. So it's gone from 10% surviving to 90, 95% surviving, all due to basic research. Other malignancies like pancreatic cancer, I lost my best friend to that um, six weeks after he was diagnosed, he died. Um, that malignancy, we're, we're, we haven't moved the needle pretty much at all. And people are actively trying to find out why. So it's not one disease. There's not one cure. The biology is different. And as you've seen now, the microbiota in us are different. And even within one tumor, there are subtle subclones or differences that exist because of this mutation process. So I don't mean to paint a bleak picture because as I said, we've done phenomenally, not me, the field has done phenomenally well with certain malignancies and people are living now that would not have been alive five years ago because of these. But you know, we still have a long way to go because as you said, Laura, it's, it's just phenomenally complex and it's all interwoven. So you have a ripple effect, right? You change this one thing and then you know, it's that old thing, you know, if a butterfly flaps its wings, something will happen down, you know, in Mexico or whatever. You, we don't fully understand how everything is interconnected, but we're working on it. Um, what about, <clears throat> you mentioned um, pediatric cancers a, a little bit, but why do you think we are seeing a growth in the diagnosis of cancer in younger people today? Um. I don't know the epidemiology. Is that true? Yeah, it is. Colon cancer, um, um, because this is a population that's not being surveilled yet with colonoscopy. Yeah. Under than fifty. 
I don't know. I'd be just waving my hands. Um, you know, you can say maybe the diet's changed. Maybe the um, we know that obesity, for example, predisposes to cancer because it establishes a low level of chronic inflammation. And inflammation is one of the ways in which the body uses to get rid of invading organisms by making um, um, superoxide radicals, for example. And those molecules that are used to kill these pathogens also can damage DNA. And um, obesity causes this low level of chronic inflammation where you've got um, um, a low but constant level of DNA damaging molecules that the body's producing. So I can imagine, you know, obesity, sedentary lifestyles, uh, changes in diet, maybe all of those are contributing, but I don't know the exact answer to your question. It's okay. Um, can you talk about removing T cells from a tumor, growing them and giving them back? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, that's just been FDA approved. Um, and so that strategy is called TIL, T-I-L, which stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. And as I showed you in that tumor microenvironment slide, in addition to the tumor cells, there are white blood cells that are in there. And so this fellow, Steve Rosenberg at the National Cancer Institute 25 years ago, thought that those T cells, those white blood cells, so T cells are a type of white blood cell. He thought that those T cells that were in the tumor were there because they could recognize something foreign of the, about the tumor, something different about the tumor, but they were not functional because the tumor was growing, right? So what he did was he teased out those infiltrating those tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, got them away from the tumor cell, and then they could grow. And if he added a few tumor cells in there, they could kill them. But in the context of the tumor microenvironment, even though they were present, they were basically shut off. And now what we can do is, um, and this gets to the specificity. So those T cells were specific for something in the tumor and Rosenberg didn't know what, but he knew that they could kill the tumor. And so now what we can do is we can take a tumor out, a biopsy, tease out those infiltrating white blood cells that are in the tumor microenvironment, get them away from the, from the immunosuppressive um, molecules that the tumor makes, grow them up to large numbers, and put them back into the patient. And if you think back to that slide I showed with the tumor on one side of a brick wall and the immune cells on the other side of the brick wall, this strategy, instead of decreasing the height of the wall, basically increases the numbers of white blood cells. So they're like a tsunami that can crash over the wall. Um, and basically um, it's a mass action effect. You've got more effector cells than you have inhibitor molecules. And so you can basically just swamp out all of the suppression because you're putting in these billions of tumor specific cells. And there's just for melanoma, and this was done for melanoma because melanoma grows on the skin, right? Um, typically, and you can take it out easily and then tease out the white blood cells. It's much more difficult to do that with um, pancreatic cancer or liver cancer or something like that. So melanoma was the first tumor that this model was developed for. And just within the last month, I think it has been, the FDA approved a one of these TIL types of therapies, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So yeah, it's, you know, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> okay, along those lines, similar, um, can you comment on the status of separating circulating cancer cells from blood using electric or magnetic fields with tagged white blood cells? Uh, we use magnets in the lab, but not on not on live mice. Um, so if we have a, so basically I'm waving my hands. No, I can't comment on it. <laughs> uh, I know we can, we can do that really well outside of an animal if we just have cells in a, in a tissue culture flask. Um, in terms of people, I mean, what's been done, which is kind of analogous to this, is that you can inject a type of immune molecule called an antibody. And antibodies are Y-shaped proteins, and each of the two hands 
will recognize something specific. So it will bind to one molecule and not another molecule. And it's they are exquisitely specific. So if you have an antibody that will bind to something on the surface of a tumor, what you can do is you can glue on some sort of effector molecule like a magnetic particle or a toxin or um, a radioisotope and have the antibody deliver your cargo to that specific cell. And if it's a toxin or a radioisotope, that can kill the, the targeted tumor cell. If it's a magnetic particle, I, you know, I, you're never going to be able to remove everything, right? And so um, that's, that's, that's the problem. But we have ways to, <laughs> we have ways to um, target specific cells using these proteins called antibodies. Is that used for a specific type of cancer that you're talking about or any? Um, it's been used for a variety of cancers. It's had the most success for leukemias, which are liquid tumors. So we think about cancers. I'm going to back up for a second. The word tumor and the word cancer are not synonymous. Tumor means abnormal cell growth. And you can have a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. A benign tumor mm -hmm. is a growth of cells that is abnormal, but they do not spread. And an example would be a wart. So a wart is an abnormal growth of cells due to um, HPV infection, but those cells don't move from where they were initially infected. So that's called a benign tumor. And those can be removed pretty easily via surgery or if it's a wart you know, with liquid nitrogen or something. A malignant tumor has two characteristics, uncontrolled growth, like a benign tumor does, but it spreads, it metastasizes, and it can spread locally or it can spread distantly. And so liquid, and so for cancers, we have what are, we call liquid cancers and solid cancers. Solid cancers are the ones you typically think of like a, you know, a mass of a tumor in, in the liver, for example. Those comprise about 85% of tumors, of cancers. The other 15% are liquid, and those are malignancies of cells in the circulation like white blood cells. And so if you inject a drug intravenously, it's going to be able to access leukemic cells in the bloodstream much more readily than it will a solid tumor because solid tumors um, create a lot of pressure, which crushes blood vessels and it keeps liquids from getting out of the blood vessels. So there are a number of issues that, um, that can prevent um, antibody therapy from working really well against solid tumors. But having said that, We've had success. We've had we've been able to modify the antibodies and get them into solid tumors better. But it's mainly worked better with liquid liquid cancers. Uh, chemotherapy is is that relevant with chemotherapy as well? That chemotherapy is not as effective against solid tumors as liquid. Sometimes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what is it that met that malignant tumors produce that creates this uncontrolled growth that benign tumors do not, or metastasis perhaps? Is better. Yeah, so there's a, there are a couple of examples. So um, there are proteases, which are enzymes that degrade proteins. And so tumors that metastasize will often express what are called um, MMPs, metallo, matrix metalloproteases, and they will chew up the proteins that are forming a barrier between, let's say, the blood system and a tumor. And so they're basically destroying those molecules and they're making a hole in the blood vessel so it can get through. So there are enzymes that tumors make that allow them to um, degrade the, the, the support structures or the structures that are keeping them in place. There are other molecules that are called chemoattractant molecules that will attract a molecule from one place to another. Um, so if you think of a hummingbird feeder, for example, you know, you put sugar water in there and the hummingbirds can can find it by following this, you know, the aerosolized sugar and it gets more concentrated, they're getting closer to the source. So tumor cells can follow chemotractic chemoattractant gradients. Um, so those are some examples, um, molecules that make them move or molecules that destroy the local barriers and allow them to access different venues. 
so I know I said I'd be here till 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 two o'clock, but I'm gonna have to leave in about five minutes because I've got a two o'clock oh. appointment. Sorry. What about two years worth of questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've got five minutes for two years. <laughs> Okay, that's all right. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, so are these proteases or um, chemo attractants uh, targets for therapies or do uh, all, cyst all cells in the body use these? So not gonna work. Yeah, so the, um, you can hopefully downregulate. So, so the proteases, you're right. They're not an abnormal protein. They're used for a, num a number of normal functions. But if a tumor cell is overexpressing it, meaning it's making thousands of more molecules than a healthy cell would, and you know why it's making a thousand more molecules and you can shut it off. It's basically turning off the uh, the hose, the spigot on a hose. So you mm -hmm. can turn off that spigot. So the water, you know, the water is the same between this spigot and that spigot, but you can turn it off here on the, on the malignant cell and let it be okay on the healthy cell. Then that's one strategy. And yeah, people are using that sort of strategy to try to um, downregulate metal matrix metalloproteases. Uh, okay, uh, so I'll try to pick just a few more questions. Uh, so is immunotherapy something that can also turn on someone's autoimmune responses? Yes. And okay. Yeah, and that's a downside. Um, sometimes it oh. happens, sometimes it doesn't. So it's a balancing act. Um, is it, That's exactly it. So yeah, if you remove the brakes on an anti-tumor response, you may remove the brakes that's keeping an autoimmune response in check. And so now you can have an anti-cancer response, but now you may be attacking some of your own healthy tissues as well. So yeah, that's right, a downside. So it doesn't just, uh, it doesn't just uh, create flare-ups for pre-existing autoimmune diseases, but it might allow an expression of a previously unexpressed, undiagnosed immune disease. Perhaps, yes, perhaps. Um, I don't know the clinical data enough to give you numbers, but yeah. That's definitely can okay. happen. Okay, maybe a good wrap up question here for you. Is there a centralized place where all therapies are analyzed and information is available about them? And how does one, it would be, this would be something that uh, someone's treating physician could use. How does your physician know what's available and what will work for someone? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, the, the central arbiter for all drugs and all therapies is the FDA. And the FDA has to approve something in order for it to be marketed to the general public. Prior to that, there are things called clinical trials where um, we don't know how well something is gonna work. So if you have a, let's say, Laura, you develop this novel therapy for leukemia and you think it's gonna be better than the existing gold standard in the field, well, then you have to perform a clinical trial in which you are comparing your therapy to the gold standard in the field. And if yours is better, then eventually the FDA will say, okay, now this is the gold standard in the field. So, um, so the FDA is the final arbiter of whether or not something makes it into the mainstream. Prior to that, it's due to clinical trials. How will your oncologist know? Hopefully he or she is keeping up with the literature and keeping up, keeping current with their credentialing and they will know um, what trials are available and what are not. There are central, central one-stop shops, if you will. The National Cancer Institute is one. Um, our Masonic Cancer Center has a website, that's another one. Um, but they're constantly changing, right? Because new things are coming out all the time. And unfortunately for the lay person, these are difficult to navigate because you have to know what you're looking for to make sense of it. So if I went, as a non-immunologist, uh, non if I went to the NCI website, you know, I wouldn't have a clue as to what to look for. So um, because it's so complex, it's, it, it's tough to make a one-stop shop for the layperson. Um, but anyway, the NCI is a good spot. And they have, they act, the, N, the NCI has actually got very, very good uh, videos and tutorials on some of the basics. If you want to get into the weeds, then it's more difficult. Okay, I'm aware of the time and that you have to go. So you will have to come back next year. Well, we'll have four years worth of questions by then. <laughs> 
maybe you'll have a bunch of answers for us by then. But yeah. in any case, thank you so very much for coming. It's a wonderful presentation. And thank you to everybody listening. I am so sorry I couldn't get to 95 out of 100 of your questions. You have all had great questions, and I'm sorry. Uh, but thank you for attending. Please join us next week, April 4th at 1230 for a presentation called D Dynamic Design in Everyday Objects with Jean McElvain. And we will hope to see you then. Thank you. And may, may I make one? I, I'm interrupting you here. From, I'm sorry. No, I'm making a plug for the Cancer Center. Um, I'm originally from New York. We moved to, my wife and I moved to Minnesota when our children were infants. We've obviously stayed here. I love the place. This is a jewel. This is a jewel in the state's crown. Uh, the Cancer Center is phenomenal. The people that work here are incredibly smart um, and conscientious. And so you should take, you know, people that are still on, should take advantage of the Cancer Center. Um, and one other quick plug is that we're considering having a mini medical school that's focused on cancer probably um, early in 2025. And um, we'll have maybe six different nights where a couple of investigators will talk about specific diseases and it will be both clinical as well as basic research. And so um, I'll keep you informed as to what's going on there. Thank you. But that we sounds are a resource that you should take advantage of. We hope um, not as a patient, but so yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you again. Okay. And we really thank appreciate you. It. Yep. Bye bye.